Are you tired of the same old pro wrestling? Then check out the amazing action on Powerslam.tv, the biggest indie pro wrestling channel in the world. Get over 4,000 hours of the best pro wrestling events from over 110 of the biggest names in the industry from over 15 countries around the globe. Get your free trial today at Powerslam.tv. The following is brought to you by the Social Suplex Podcast Network. First episode of Social Suplex Podcast about AEW with a proclivity for positivity. Welcome to All Things Elite. I am your host, Floyd Johnson, and with me today is my special birthday guest, uh, the uh, Irish Mexican JR. How you doing today, JR? I'm doing good, Floyd. Uh, yesterday was a very special day. I turned 32 and I got a birthday parade from some of my college graduates who came down. So- saw me so it was a really cool experience and I it's probably one of the best uh best birthdays I had in a long time. Well happy birthday to you. How old you turn if you don't mind 30, saying? Thirty two. All right. And I do want to send a special shout out to uh friend of the show uh at best about Alex. Alex had a birthday uh Friday or was it to yesterday yesterday it was yesterday okay yeah so we both that was uh we both shared the same birthday so that was really cool and i reached out to uh best spot alex to uh wish happy birthday and hopefully we get to meet up at the first AEW event yeah um i like i always say my schedule's a little confusing i stay up all night so i get confused on what days everything is so and so, yeah, so it was like, I just like, was it Friday, Saturday? I don't know. Yeah, and but, the other thing, too, is also weird is because of how the A, I call it our AW family, we're so big and spread out. I yeah. mean, we have people all over the world. So we, I think I'll see ber- uh, some birthday wishes for for Alex, I think around 7 or 8 o'clock uh, Pacific Coast time. And it was the people wishing happy birthday. Because they were so far ahead. On their timeline, it was already May 16th for them. So, yeah, that's one of the amazing things about AEW is our family fan base and how wide we are. Yeah, it, it, you know what? That is that is great. I feel like the fan base started at, of course, the All In and has continued through all of the events and shows. Seeing everybody, uh, it's like it's like a reunion every time we meet up. So when that first event happens, I know it's going to sell out. I know, like, you know, if they do, like, StarCast, that's going to sell out because I think all of us have been stuck in the house so long that we just can't wait to get out and get somewhere. I just got my I got my email for uh, the Jericho Cruise this week, so I'm waiting on the date that I can book. Yeah, that Jericho Cruise, I, I want – I'm not a fan of cruises to begin with. I just don't – I don't like the concept of being stuck on a vessel, but I tell you, with with everybody being there and how, how many members of the AEW family and how amazing it was the AEW Dynamite episode um, in uh, for this year, and that's supposed to be live next year, um, live for, on the cruise. I I really have, I'm really really considering going. Um, if anything can get me on a cruise, it's going to be wrestling. My wife is a twin, so. Uh... Yeah. Her and her sister's birthday are around there. And I told them, hey, let's go on the cruise. And they were like, you know, of course, yes. 
And and they were, uh, you know, I told them, I was like, you can do all the regular cruise stuff because what most people don't realize, it's still a normal cruise. It still has the, you know, gambling and all that stuff. But then it has wrestling theme events. So I'll go do the wrestling stuff and y'all go do the other stuff. And then we'll meet and eat between whenever it's time to eat. Oh, yeah. I think um, I think it was Ollie Tiffany. I think she had a a picture with one of the young bucks and it was like in the casino part yes of um and i'm not sure if it was the jericho cruise or if it was in um i think it was jericho cruise. i don't think it was just in vegas but i i know i saw a lot of pictures of like the casino part which i'm a big big time gambler so the fact is and you see how big that crew that the cruise ship is i mean i'm i can only imagine how much amazing stuff there is to do on that cruise yeah, uh, I saw, I think the Young Bucks were at a hibachi restaurant. I'm like, that's what I'm excited about. I'm excited about the wrestling stuff, meeting the wrestlers, but food. I love, I just like, I just like different food. Uh, I'm a big, I like, I wouldn't call myself a foodie, but I do like to eat a lot. So, uh, but thank you. For, <laughs> it was last minute getting you on the show, and I thank you for coming in. Uh, we've been talking about you being on the show for about a month now. So I was like, man, I was like, I don't have anybody on the show. And I was like, dude, JR, you were like one of my thoughts. And I was like, great. And uh, just to let everybody know, start off the show, remind you, All Things Lead is brought to you by Power Slam TV. You can get access to over 4,000 hours of content from over 110 of your favorite wrestling brands from countries all around the globe, right onto your mobile device. Use the code Social Suplex to get the first month free. Also, um, you know, make sure you're following the show or Social Suplex on Google or Apple Podcasts. You can either follow the network, Social Suplex Podcast Network, or you can follow the direct show, All Things Elite. And make sure you're following all of us on our social medias. That's at all at AT Elite Pod, at Social Suplex, at Phoenix AEW, at All Elite Tiffany on Twitter. And JR, hit them up with your Twitter. My Twitter is at JR underscore Irish Mexican. At JR underscore Irish Mexican. Make sure you are following him. He is he is definitely in the proclivity of positivity family. If you check out you check out my tweets, you check out Tiffany's, you check out his, Amy's, all of us, we try to focus on the things we like in wrestling. We try to focus on the things that make us happy. Because, you know. There's enough people uh, focusing on the things that they don't like and what makes them sad. But uh, I, I've always said I don't consider myself a critic. I consider myself a fan that just likes to talk about wrestling and hope people enjoy me talking about the things I like. I do know sometimes I don't like things, but I always try to give you my honest opinion. So, JR, I don't. I, we did not talk before the show about what you watched. I got some... Pretty decent notes here, but did you happen to catch the BTE living in the woods? Yes, I did. And one of the things about um, AEW is AEW is just one show a week. You, I mean, I think if fans tune in, if you're watching just Dynamite, you're really missing out on the whole how storyline set up. And you gotta watch BTE. You gotta watch Dark. You gotta watch The Road too because it really it, it encompasses the storylines you get a lot of uh, side things going on and there's a lot of uh, easter eggs out there one of the things i as i watched um the beginning of uh, bte and i always get the young bucks mix up that's why i just that's why i never call them by their name but it it's um the do you, one do you know the easiest way to figure it out right no i do not matt like matt hardy has dark hair Nick, like Jeff Hardy, has blonde hair. Okay, so it'd be Matt. So Matt, uh, Matt Jackson was with his kids, and just his kids mess with them. He and he's having this, uh, the you know, freak out moment with the toast, and all of a sudden, we see some burnt toast with some initials in the toast. And I'm just saying, I think you and I are both on the same page. Who's our favorite? One of our favorite tag teams? It's FTR. And I'm oh my god! I I one of the things is about FTR is I don't want them to be I just weird I don't want them to be exclusive to AEW I want them to be like hired hitmen because I want them to be able to wrestle so many great tag teams that's not just in AEW but all over the world. 
And I, but we all, I think we all agree is that if they get this match uh, between FTR and Young Bucks, it'll probably be the biggest match in the history of tag team wrestling easily since probably TLC. It's my tag team dream match. I am very open about that, that it's my tag team, like clearly my tag team dream match. Um, I mean, the Young Bucks, like, if you talk about my favorite tag teams, I will tell anybody. It's FTR, and then it's uh, Proud and Powerful, or Santana and Ortiz. Those are my two favorite tag teams. But as far as the, one of the hottest tag teams that reminds me of the, the tag teams that remind me of my childhood, the Young Bucks, in my opinion, are the Rock and Roll Express of today. They're the white meat baby faces. Now, I mean, and now they're the white meat baby faces. Uh, everyone loves them. You know, when they fail, they kind of fail in you. Uh, you know, you kind of feel their failure too. And then FTR is, of course, the Midnight Express. Uh, they're the Hill Tag Team, the quintessential Hill Tag Team. You hate them because they're so good. So this matchup, like the tease of it, is everything I want. I, I, I want it to be built correctly. I want it to mean something. I know it might not be, but I really, really want it to be for the tag team titles. Um, it's like, I agree with you 100% everything you just said, and I do feel the, um, the Rock and Roll Express was a little bit before my time. So for, for me, I, I kind of, I, I, if I compare it to a team, it would probably be my, gener- my generation probably closer to the Hardys. Um, but going back and reliving like the uh, wrestling, like the Midnight Express and uh, the Rock and Roll Express, I feel the same sentiments. Just on a quick tangent, though, did you see um, somebody had tweeted out to uh, Uncle Dave about um, the comparisons? They said a uh, certain wrestler was somebody, and Uncle Dave said that the uh, Young Bucks was a modern day Midnight Express, and Dax had said, Are you kidding me? We're the modern day Midnight Express. Why don't you go ask the Midnight Express themselves who they see? Is the modern day Midnight Express? Yeah, I thought that I, was a little I, bit. I, I thought that was a little funny. Yeah, I actually retweeted it from. Uh, I, I retweeted it from the All Things Elite account. I think sometimes, and I I might be perf- perfectly wrong. I th- Dave might play it straight. I think. Uh, I think he does sometimes say stuff to uh, get at people, like he does say stuff for the reaction. Cause come on. The Young Bucks and the Midnight Express, I mean, I guess they work tag teams. I don't see how they work similar. I mean, someone else might out there, hey, disagree with me. Like I said, I'm just a fan that's talking about what I observe. I don't see their t- the Young Bucks' style as similar to the Midnight Express. But by the time I really knew who the Young Bucks were, they had kind of went face. You know what I mean? So I don't think mm-hmm. I saw the heel PWG Young Bucks. Maybe they were closer to the Midnight Express. I just don't have time to really go back and check that out. Yeah, I mean, I, I do remember part of their heel run when they were, like, in seen matches and when they were in the junior the junior heavyweight division and uh, in Japan and uh, some of the stuff in Ring of Honor. But yes. I, just don't, I just don't see the same style. Um, you know, the Midnight Express. Yeah. And as well as, um, you know, for me, one of the main reasons why I, I loved FTR was because they reminded me so much of Art Anderson and Tully Blanchard. That is Ooh. always my comparison because I am a big Art Anderson guy. So I agree with you on that statement. To, to me, Art Anderson is just, he's a top three GOAT. And I, I love that man. I, I had a chance to meet him and he's amazing. And I, they just remind me of them. Um, but. I um, I just didn't see the 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 style they had was like that grind down, you know, keep an opponent break break down the body part. Whereas that's not the young buck style, and so I just didn't see that comparison. But yeah, yeah, I, I and, and that's what funny. I'm saying. That's why I've always saw them even closer to Arn and Tully than the Midnight Express. The Midnight Express, you know, when I I like I said the matches I remember. I was a kid when I saw the Midnight Express. I don't I don't go out and watch old wrestling a lot because there's so much new wrestling. Uh, but when I was a kid, the Midnight Express were a technically proficient tag team. But the body part tag team 
was the Brain Busters, Arn Anderson, Tully Blanchard, Arn Anderson, and Ole Anderson. They were the body part guys. They would work on the arm until they, you know, make you try to make you tap out or just to wear out, wear it out that body part. And I remember Ricky Morton, man, he was amazing at selling. Amazing at selling. Him selling his arm reminds me of Matt Hardy selling his back. Another rock and roll express to uh, the Young Bucks uh, comparison. But hey, like I said, Dave Meltzer probably knows and has forgotten more about wrestling than I'll ever know, even though I know a lot. But I have, you know, he's been deep inside and on the other side of professional wrestling since the 70s. So I trust his comparisons. But I am 100% certain, well, in my mind, I'm saying this is all my speculation, that he does say stuff to get a rise out of people sometimes. Well, and I, uh, I tell people all the time, I, someone like a Dave Meltzer, um, I respect him so much for being a historian of wrestling. And then you hit the nail on the head with that when you said that he's forgotten more about wrestling than most people know about wrestling. And um, I do think uh, in today's with uh, Twitter trolls and stuff like that, he definitely does things to uh, – to just get them wild up, but he he has I nothing anybody can ever take away from him, no matter how sometimes critical I I could be of his take sometimes. Um, he he's one of the if not the best the greatest wrestling historian, one of the top two wrestling historians out there. Yeah. Um and and so um when he decides to hang it up, it would definitely be um the, there'll be a, a void in the wrestling historian and um. I, I just love watching old wrestling because I, I want to try to learn as much as I can about the history of wrestling as well as today's current product. Oh, and absolutely. Me personally, most of my old wrestling that I watch is on the WWE Network. You will catch me watching just like 92 or 93 Survivor Series out of nowhere just because that's what, you know, I have access to it. it I'm always signed into it. And, you know, but like uh, Josh will recommend matches and Jeremy will recommend matches on Keeping It Strong Style. I genuinely go out of my way to find out the matches that they recommend because it's a different style. Like I I am 2007, late 2017 and beyond New Japan. So whenever they say, uh, whenever they say classic matches from the time in New Japan that I didn't watch wrestling, uh, I always try to look those up because, I mean, unlike, you know, the Midnight Express and Rock and Roll Express, which I did enjoy when I was a young kid, and I, I do remember seeing those matches, some of that New Japan stuff I've never seen. So that's what I'm more likely to go look up. And it's just such a different style. It's so hilarious. But uh, back to being the elite living in the woods. Um, so, yeah, uh, Young Bucks talk about you know, not being there. And uh, then Peter uh, Peter takes the kick out challenge. Uh, and it looks like it's some local people that I've never heard of. And um, he, he, he was doing great. He kicked out all the pins. And then at the last minute, there was a roll up and he took the three. He's a loser just like Brandon Cutler. And then I just feel like, and I feel like this is building up to a Brandon Cutler versus Peter Avalanche match. And as ridiculous as it sounds, I think it should be on a pay per view. Yeah, I'm gonna have to disagree on that one. I I think they're both. I, I've um, I love a lot of AEW's roster. I just never. Um, I just wasn't a fan of Peter Avalon. No, I mean I I not take anything away from him or or Brandon Cutler. I could see. Um, I could see something that like, I, I think this is going to head towards more maybe a headline in a AEW Dark. Yeah, the um, main event of Dark. That probably makes yeah. more sense. But yeah, I just thought it would be so. You know, AEW occasionally likes to do a ridiculous wow. match. To have Peter Avalon and Brandon Cutler on a pay per view fighting to see who can win their first match. That would be hilarious. I could see it be- being a. Um, on the um on the buy in. Yes. Oh definitely, definitely. Um I wouldn't I wouldn't be against that. I just think uh I mean I don't want to um to minimize, you know, Peter Avalon and Brad and Color, especially because Brad Color is such an unsung hero of, 
of AEW and BTE. Um, I just think that would, you know, for some of our favorite stars of AEW, play, you know, playing a match like that on the pay-per-view, I think would just take away time. Uh, and do you take away a match and then, or do you, you know, take away a match time from another match for this one, especially since it's, it's on BTE and a lot of us, you know, watch both BTE as well as Dynamite, but there's also a specific crowd that only watches Dynamite. Yeah, would probably order the pay per view. So, if you put this on the pay per view itself, and people, I don't know if people would really understand who, what this match is about. Let and me so tell I, I you, could... you got me a good idea there. It should be the main event of a BTE. It should be the match on a BTE episode, like Matt and Nick. <laughs> oh, absolutely! I absolutely, I think that's a great idea. I mean, the yeah. fact is, when they had that match, and there was a. Oh, I'm gonna mess it up. But there was they had the um there was a few matches on inside the, the tennis courts. Yeah. And I thought that was great. It just was, you know, we need content, especially right now. You know, if if they build this up to be, you know, this Monday on BTE or the Monday after double or nothing, I I mean, we need more content out there and it'd be great to have their match. Yes, absolutely. Uh yeah, that actually makes more sense. Honestly, it's just one of those matches. I want to see anywhere. And as funny as they both are, I want it to be like an epic match where they're both like trying their hardest not to, you know, lose to the other. You know, those are the only two people they haven't lost to is each other. So I just, like I said, I just want it to be like tail of the tape, dramatic type to see who can get their first win. And then the next week they just go back to losing. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. That was. Yeah. So uh, Hangman went to live out in the woods. He went a little crazy. Uh, it's probably a reference to a TV show or something. I don't watch any of those TV shows. So I literally have no clue what it, it might have been referencing. Do you have any clue what it might have been referencing? I, I have no idea. I've seen a lot of um, I've seen a lot of YouTube videos. Um, one of the ones I, I love is called the channel. It's called Primitive, Primitive Technology, where a guy literally goes lives out in the jungle and makes and makes a hut out of mud and sticks. Um, it could be something like that. It could, I don't know. I don't know where the reference is from, um, but I just miss Hangman, though. I, I, I mean, I know every, a lot of people, and I love them too, Omega and Hardy as a team and what they've been doing, but I just miss Hangman, and I want him back on Dynamite. Yeah, I, I, I definitely, that has been one of the things. His character, uh at the last Dynamite, it felt like the hottest character in professional wrestling. And no matter what you say, whether it's their fault or not, it's really cooled off. And I don't think they have done a good enough job. And, and like, I don't know if this is negative or whatever. I just don't think they've done a good enough job of keeping him regular, uh, relevant on the TV show. You know, like they did the clips for the women's division. They did a clip for the tag team division. I think they just got need to remind people that Hangman was a thing, especially for people that might have gotten into Hangman and then and then he just kind of disappeared. You know, hey, I mean, this ain't WWE. And so, you know, address why one of your biggest stars is gone right now. So, I don't uh, know. It, it, in addition to that, for me, I was um, I became a Hangman fan when he joined the Bullet Club because I loved I, I I loved him being a cowboy, and for me, I grew up Western in our area. So I'm as soon as I saw like this is Hangman, you know, a lot of people there, a lot of people love. Uh, I still love like Kenny Omega or Adam Cole or the Young Bucks, and then um, and I love and Cody is is my number one favorite talent uh, right now. Um, but Hangman was always there to me. He's neck and neck as far as my top two favorite guys, uh, top two wrestlers in AEW is Hangman. And so when we went to Double or Nothing and he won the 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 Battle Royal to get the title shot, I mean, I know a lot of people wanted Jericho to be the first champion, but I really wanted to make uh, Hangman Adam Page to be the first AEW champion. I'm just really big on Hangman. I had a chance to meet him a few times. I, I really love him. I love his style. I love his finisher. And, um, you know, I, I know that 
he's probably that wasn't the right move and I get it because Jericho is the name and he's the and he needed to be the champion for Dynamite. And then it seemed he kinda of cooled off, but then his character development, especially with Omega getting the championship. I remember like at um at Revolution there was that possibility of like he well, they're kind of teasing this, you know, this heel turn where he's gonna turn on Omega and I feel like a lot of people and even non, you know, not big fans of AEW were really buying into Hangman Adam Page. And then once everything, you know, the world went into lockdown, he hasn't been there and we haven't seen him. And I think you said it's correct is that he needs to be on that show in some capacity, whether it's doing interviews or something. So people know, hey, uh, there's still one half of the tag team champions that's out there. And uh, don't forget about him. Yeah, that and that's what I'm like. It's just they went on with Kenny and Matt Hardy, and that's fine. And like I said, I understand while they're doing it. I understand it, it's you have to adjust, but it's just like Hangman. Right now, the only place you really can see Hangman is on being the elite. So that's weird. That sh- to me shouldn't be that way. And the other thing too is if they're holding them out because of this potential. Um, you know, potential return, that's not going to be a good thing because he's going to return in front of nobody. Yeah. So that's you're not going to get you, that pop. You, yeah, you need to save the return for, if you were going to save the return, save it into to in front of audiences. Then we had Scorpio Scott and Frankie K playing some kind of coin against the wall game. Do you, have you ever seen or this game? Uh, I, I, like, I didn't know what game they were playing. Um. I have played different types of games of quarters. I've never seen this. This seems to me, this seems to be a, um, a, if I could give a guess, it's something that the, that the wrestlers do in the locker room during downtime. And somebody's like, Hey, let's come up with this idea, you know, idea of this game. Um, it seems like a cool concept. It's definitely something if I was in a locker room and during downtime between matches, I would try to come up with something. And if you think about it, you know, we all have pocket change. It's easier to do that than, Instead of bringing, you know, handheld video game systems or, you know, a board game or something like that in the locker room. So I think it's a cool concept. Never heard of it, but I think it's cool. Yeah, I was like to say, I think we needed Matt Hardy to explain uh, the rules of this game and the broken brilliance. Uh, I, I think it, I think the concept, if I, if I figured it out correctly just based on the video, is whoever can get as close to the wall without touching the wall and you can't and the way it looked like it was you couldn't use the wall as a backboard so that's my that's my assumption is what it is is that you have to get as close as you can to the wall without hitting it and you can't use it as a backboard that's what it looked like to me at least well we got more of hangman in the woods he seemed to be going crazy and then we get marco stunt going out in the woods yeah, the Marco stump, it was a little bit, I was a little bit thrown off because Mar- we saw Marco stump on Wednesday on Dynamite with Jurassic Express, so they met up, so I don't, I was just a little thrown off about the Marco stump thing. I thought if, you know, I was perfectly fine with him going to the woods because it looked like he was going to find Jurassic Express or he, maybe there was, he was going to get attacked. Um, I don't know, I was just a little bit. When we went to Dynamite and he was with them, I was just kind of like lost. I was like, okay, we're going with this. But So and then Matt and Nick play tennis and somehow uh, Matt gets busted a wide open. He gets color playing tennis. I'm very confused by this. <laughs> that was funny. I've, I've rolled my ankle playing te- te- tennis. I've never once got a uh, never once got busted open with the ball. And apparently uh, Kenny Omega... Uh, was talking about being in a street fight, and he's uh, Chris Harrington told him he never looked like he had been in a street fight before. He said that was his first street fight, and he's like he never looked like he'd been in a street fight before. And you know, Chris Harrington went a little crazy. He said that he could beat him in a street fight, which Chris Harrington's pretty tough, so maybe, maybe, just maybe. Uh, but no, it was like I say, it was kind of a fun episode like all episodes of bt are fun uh but hopefully hangman returns from the woods in time for double or nothing if you know he's gonna be on double or nothing 
And it was uh, so we are done with. Let's see. Real yep. quick on real quick on BTE though the ending of the uh, two things about the ending of though with uh, Kenny Omega, it's funny that he he basically got punked by four guys and then Cole Cabana comes in and then Kenny gets you know yeah. gets up and he starts chasing him out. I thought that was hilarious and um, and then the other thing was somebody made uh, Twitter and I did retweet it. It was the anatomy of a street fighter and it was a picture of Kenny Omega. As if he was like in a you know Street Fighter video game or a uh, Tekken video game, I thought it was really cool. Um, I I I thought he looked like a Street Fighter. I mean, that's how I would dress up as a Street Fighter if I if I was you know I would look like Kenny Omega. I would take my wrist, I'd wear jeans and a cut off shirt. <laughs> yeah, uh, if I was in a street fight, I probably I don't you know being from where I'm from, we didn't really schedule street fights. So you just kind of wore what you were in, so yeah, I don't know. It's like, is in the wrestling world is a uh, is a strange world where you schedule a three foot street fight. You know, I always saw in those movies back in the day, and he's like, the bully said he was gonna beat up the kid at three o'clock. That never really happened. I remember when the bully wanted to beat you up. It didn't really matter where you were. He just started beating you up. So. All right. So, it, yeah. it reminded me of the uh, the the. It reminded me of the movie The uh, Outsiders, yes. and uh, where they all get dressed up for the Rumble, and the yeah. late Patrick Swayze's character, he has that skin tight shirt, and um, you know the the Soch versus the um, the Greaser. So, but yeah, I thought it was. Um, we actually did. I, I shouldn't uh, to end this quickly, but we did schedule uh, not street fight, but we did have an area when we were in middle school. It was called the Greens, and if you were going to fight, that's where it was going to be. It was going to be after school because then we wanted to get suspended. Yeah, like I said, I remember people fighting, but it was just like you were on the bus, and you just fought when you got off the bus. Because so, the bus, weird thing with us, and I'll, I'll, we'll, I'll be quick. The bus was still considered at school. You were yes. at school from the moment you got on the bus in the morning to the time you walked in the house. So if you were on the bus and you got in a fight, you could still be suspended from school. And you got off the bus and technically they didn't know. They got off the bus and technically they didn't know that if you had gotten a house, like you got off the bus and started fighting, you could still be suspended. So technically. Yes, we, us too. Yeah. Technically, you had to go walk in your house, come back out of your house and fight. But the thing is, if you were going to fight most people weren't thinking about getting suspended. They just didn't like each other, so they just fought wherever. And most of the time, they just didn't tell. You know what I mean? It's just like, whatever. <laughs> it's like, yeah. I was like, I got in several fights. I never got suspended for fighting, not once. I know, I know that shocks everybody because of how nice I am. But, you know, between the times of 12 and, like, 20, your hormones are just stupid. So that's a thing. <laughs> So everything pisses you off and you don't know how to control anything. You know how that works. Everyone over here, if you listen to the show, you're an adult. Um, so we then had the Road to Double or Nothing. Uh, Road to Double or Nothing this week was fairly straightforward. It was uh, building up the TNT uh, tournament. Then you had a sit-down interview with Jungle Boy and Cody Rhodes. Uh, that was good. Basically, Jungle Boy asked Cody how to win. I don't well, against you know uh, against um, MJF, and Cody's like, "Well, I didn't beat him, but if I'm going to give you any advice, is just don't get caught up in the game." And it, it was serious. He's like, "I got caught up," and Jungle Boy, I mean uh, MJF, controlled the whole situation. And then you had Dasha. She was talking to Tony Schiavone about being on. Uh, the uh, Titan Games, which it looks like it's going to be different, because I watched every episode of Titan Games last week, last year, and I guess this year it's going to be closer to American Gladiators, like you will be competing against Titans or heroes or whatever, and that'll be interesting. And Dasha's athletic background, I did not know about, and uh, apparently she had uh, trained in wrestling for a while, and she looks forward to getting in the ring. So I wonder if this is a setup to Dasha transitioning to being a wrestler. What do you think about that? I definitely think it's possible. One of the things about AEW that I really enjoy is they have such a great um, 
broadcast team from from the commentators, announcers. And so um, I was, as you mentioned that, I did not know about her background. Um, from what I can see, um, she was, um, she actually has a degree in microbiology. She was a contestant in the Miss America uh, organization of pageants. She was also a swimmer, diver, and gymnastics until she suffered a knee injury. Um, this is just, obviously, this this is quickly looking up by Wik- Wikipedia, so I can't say this is 100% accurate. Um, she did have a contract in developmental with uh, NXT, and she was wrestling. She did the end-up debut, but then they transitioned her to a full-time interviewer before she um, was released last year and uh, then ended up working for AEW. So I, if she is um, based on being active and she's a competitor, and I think at the end of the day, um, that's still going to be in her heart that she wants to compete. I think... Um, she has a great look, and I think she would do very well in the AEW women's divisions if she decides to go that route. And also, as great as she is on the mic, it's not going to hurt because they have such a great um, backstage interview, whether you know they've been using Taz for doing a little bit behind the scenes. They have uh, Lexi Nair, and they have, is it Jen Decker or is it Jen Sturger? I think it's Jen Sturger. I think it. No, it or, used to be or, Jen Sturger. It is now Jen Decker. She, her okay. married name is Decker. Okay, um, who is phenomenal at what she does, especially like on the road to. Um, she was doing uh, some narration with that, and she does the AEW Top Five. So, um, I definitely don't. Um, she will not be missed being a broadcast uh, commentator if she decides to go the route of being a uh, active in the women's division of AEW. Then what did we get? Uh, we got a the video, uh, basically thanking Chris Jericho for uh, well, in essence, making him famous. Uh, so I was like, that's pretty great. And he's like, you know, we we'll never know what's gonna happen in a match. I this is probably the best built squash match I've ever seen. Like, I dude. love. Um, I call him Pineapple P because I'll, I probably would screw up if I said Shug D. Is it Shug D? Is that how you Shug say D. It? Sugar Dunkerton. Shug D. I love this man. I um, when he first came and everybody was Pineapple P, and we had in, in our friends, our AEW family, they were you know hyping him up. And at first, I was like, oh, this is kind of funny, and you know, this is cool. Let's get behind him. The minute I heard him speak, I'm like, this guy. Why has he not been a star 16 years in the business? And he just, he has a really good look. He has, he can talk. I don't know why he's never broken through. You know, I know this is a cosmetic business and he could probably, you know, work a little bit on his cosmetically. Um, but besides that, I don't know why. I just, everything about him, his the clothes he wears, um, his hair, his... Um, I just love everything about him, and I and if ever I compare him to um, a, in a from an organization, Kofi Kingston, I think he could be bigger than Kofi Kingston for AEW. I don't know what it is. I just love this guy, and I I asked like you know after especially after Bro to Double or Nothing, I wanted him to murder Jericho. Yeah, uh, he's a very. He's a very charismatic character. He also brings this whole idea of uh he brings this whole idea that uh you know anybody can do it and he's been in the business for a very long time. He's got an interesting character. He's very good on the mic. Uh those backstage interviews, he makes himself an appealing person and he's just kind of got this goofy look. I don't know what he can be. I don't know what his ceiling is. But I am interested in seeing it. I don't know if this Chris Jericho thing we'll talk about later is uh, is like his ceiling or is he'll just go away or are we going to get more of him. But I really do. I have enjoyed his uh, time in AEW. And like I said, I didn't really know who he was. I had seen his video for when he wanted to be Sean Spears' partner and things like that. But I didn't really understand 
uh, I didn't really understand what was good about him until I got to see his whole character. It's like when I tell people, when they talk about professional wrestling, and I love people like saying, well, the person that's best bell to bell is the best professional wrestler. And it's like with me, I've always said professional wrestling encompasses so much more than what you do in the ring. And Suge, from what I've seen, has all that stuff that you can do outside of the ring, the character and everything. He might be a great wrestler. I just, every match I've seen him, he's pretty much lost in less than five minutes. So I don't know how good of a wrestler he is. But, you know, he does get the other part of professional wrestling. And as a mid to lower card character, I love him. I think he's a very a good, could he be a main eventer? Maybe. I, you know what? I've been wrong in the past. I don't see it, but I've been wrong in the past. So, yeah. he, can, he But he does have that whole fan base behind him thing. And they kind of, uh, this week on the Dynamite, when we get to it, they kind of played us like a fiddle when it came to that. Then we had uh, Brody Lee in the Dark Order. Uh, a guy was picking on some other members of the Dark Order that was hanging up signs. He got introduced to Mr. Brody, who beat him up, and then let the then let his uh, goons handle the rest of it. Uh, I think uh, uh, Preston Vance, a.k.a. 10, was the main big guy with him. So I thought that was pretty cool. So, um, I originally, and, and I'll just be completely honest, I saw nothing in the Dark Order. I I was not a fan of their look. I support, From what I've read, they were, and what I've heard is that they were at one point considered the greatest tag team in all of tag team wrestling. I, I just don't see it. Um, I I don't think that Evil Uno has a good look. That's just my opinion. Every, you know, everybody, you know, I never want anybody not to have a job. I'll say that. So I'm glad that they have working. But I think once Brody Lee came out and the character of the Exalted One and his vignettes and i know a lot of people say like oh he's knocking his former boss and you know maybe maybe not i think it's i really think it's enjoyable i'm now behind the dark order i you know i post all the time hashtag join dark order uh, we are one i really do like the character i think Brody Lee is such a phenomenal talent inside the ring um, i think he has a great look i don't know about the business suits i probably wouldn't go that far with him i mean he's supposed to be like this corporate person but um, I I do like the Dark Order, and I really do like Brody Lee a lot now. Yeah, what you're saying about the Dark Order was how a lot of people were at the very beginning. I remember uh, they kind of debuted with a wet thud. I'm like, we're in the in arena, and they debut, and everybody's like, who is this? Like, no one knows who they are. Uh, people like uh, the first, they were the spooky perverts. And everybody didn't get it. And then they went to the cult thing. And it was hot for a few weeks there. It's like it's been a roller coaster ride. It's like it's one of those things. It's a trust the process situation. You know, you kind of got to let, you know, the thing is AEW is a bunch of people that have never that a lot of people, the production side, they've gotten it down. But just a lot of people that have never ran a wrestling promotion. So they're, they're going to be hits and misses. And. Dark Order is a great sign of how good that they are and how they can pivot because it was a miss and now it's somewhat of a hit. Now the Dark Order Act is main eventing, uh, main eventing double or nothing. Also, right now the number one contenders are the Dark Order tag team, and I imagine if the world wasn't broken right now, they would probably be getting the title shot at double or nothing. Yeah, it's definitely it's definitely possible, and I, I like what they did by adding um. Uh, 10 yes. because it definitely expands them um, it from it looks like that there's a possibility maybe some travel issues with getting uh, Evil Uno and Stu Grayson to uh, Dynamite so this keeps the Dark Order I think still in play beyond just Brody Lee and um, you know it's I think it's good I, I like it a lot and like I said I think Brody Lee just gives just solidifies them as just being um, a bigger you know st- faction or stable whatever you want to call it and he's just so good on the ring and like i said i don't know the one thing i wouldn't probably do is just the the suits because that's just not brody lee that's not that's not the look for him but other than that i like i love it yeah you see the one thing i, I i'm missing out on and you know i completely blame this on uh 
I completely blame this on, you know, the world, is that we haven't got to see an Evil Uno, Stu Grayson, and Brody Lee six-man tag. And it's just like people, I, I've heard somewhat complaints about how he's been built up over the last few weeks, and it's just like they're doing what they can in the situation that they're in. So, oh, absolutely. And um, to that, specific to that point is just wrestling in general. It doesn't matter if you like AEW or WWE. And I would even take this step further. Even if, you, even if, you know, if you're a fan of, you know, UFC, these are the three things that are going on right now. WWE, AEW, and UFC that's been out there. Um, and what they're doing is try to put content, but because of whether it's travel restrictions or current situations because talents can't be there, you have to throw the current, you know, a previous game plan or whatever was normal out the window because now they're having to adapt to this current new environment and make the best of the situation. So while, you know, Brody Lee is the face of the Dark Order and, you know, we keep hearing about Ivo Uo and Stu Grayson, but because they can't be there, that shouldn't be a knock on AEW. They're just doing the best they can with the cards that are dealt with them. Yeah, and I think they really, and I think all companies, to a certain extent, um, but it's, and I'll, I really want to tout AEW. Every single time I get, I want to tout them for what they're doing with the talent they have and how great and transparent. Um, I call him Uncle Tony, but Tony Khan is with the production staff. You know, telling talent if you if you don't want to come, we're not going to force you. Um, bringing in a lot of the um, independent wrestlers to give them jobs and just making the best storylines that they possibly can. And we'll get more, I mean, and then I'll just send it there because we'll get more into what they're doing um, through Dynamite. Okay. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, we will quickly, quickly, because uh, there's no reason to talk about a match for match because we kind of know what's going to happen. Well, we know what's going to be the result of each match as you go. We're going to quickly go through Dark. Uh, we had Colt Cabana pinning uh, the Captain Sean Dean. We had Jungle Boy and Luchasaurus pinning Mike Reed and Ryan Rembrandt getting for ready for their match on Dynamite against the Best Friends. Private Party, because this was a super size episode. I believe there was nine matches. Uh, Private Party beat uh, Lee Johnson and Musa. Uh, Ten beat John Cruz. Ray Phoenix beat Alan Angles, and he gave him Alan Angels. Alan Angels might, you know end up being someone used in AEW a lot more in the future. Uh, he had two matches. He had that much talked about match with Kenny Omega. And then they had this match with Ray Phoenix. Ray Phoenix gave him some offense, but finished him with that driver move. It starts, I don't even know what it's called, but it starts off in the, you know, in like a position, uh, not a fireman's carry, electric chair position, and then he drives him down. He spins him and drives him down. It's a pretty cool move. Chris Statlander defeated Danny Jordan. Orange Cassidy defeated uh, Jason Cade. And last, Dr. Britt Baker beat Skylar Moore. I feel like I'm missing the main event. Was there a main event? Yes. Well, um, what, what match am I missing? I don't. This is my notes, and I think I accidentally deleted it. Luther versus Havoc. Oh, my God. Luther versus Havoc. Uh, it was like a hardcore match. It was like everything you would think a Luther versus Havoc match was, but it was kind of done in a kind of sanitized way. Like there was no blood and all that kind of stuff. But in the end, uh, uh, Kip Sabian and Penelope Cruz distracted Luther as, uh, Jimmy Havoc did a cradle DDT to get the win. I was like, I knew a match was missing. I don't know how I deleted that when I was taking notes. All right, but that was AEW Dark. Apparently, there's going to be another Super Size episode this week with a lot more matches. But now, let's get to the main event of our show, the AEW Dynamite May, uh, May 13, 2020 review. Uh, we start with Lance Archer and Jake the Snake in the ring. Jake the Snake says the only way he's going to apologize to Brandy is if she kisses his ass, which, yeah, and then he basically said, a woman's place is in the kitchen. I, you know, some people didn't like this. I was like, I mean, he's a 60, he's a 60 year old white guy from Georgia. I mean, what do you, what do you expect? 
No, no. Yeah. It's called Drawing Heat. And Jake the Snake's an old school guy. And even more in this much more woke, uh, sensitive world we live in, which, you know, I'm not saying that's a bad thing, not saying it's a good thing. It's just what it is. What he says is more of a heelish thing than it has ever been in his life. It was a heelish thing in the 80s. In 2020, it'll get you stabbed. It, it definitely might get you canceled. But it's it's very much, it draws more heat. I think it would have played better in front of a crowd. But that's what Jake the Snake does. And it's like, when you bring in old school wrestlers to do things, they're going to cut promos and do things in an old school way. Is it positive? I actually enjoy his promos. I enjoy Jake. I know some people might not. But, you know, we are kind of conditioned to get offended whenever we can now. So. <laughs> um, my only thing I didn't I mean I'm not a, obviously I'm not a woman so I, I can't speak to that the one part that I think he took maybe a little bit too far was there was a little bit of I would say some sexual innuendos I think that for me that kind of crossed the line a little bit um, he talked about I think something I think he used the, the phrase like you know pleasure or something like that it was it was towards the end of his promo yeah, yeah. Um, I know exactly I think, what you're talking about. He's like, basically, so, I will let you, when I get in the mood, I'll let you come pleasure me. Yeah, and so I think I think he did, that part, I think he's just like, okay, it's a little much, and it is hard because, uh, let's, I'll just lump all of them in together, whether it's Jake, whether it's everybody's favorite crazy uh, um, Kentuckian, Jim Cornette, Jerry the King Lawler, these guys are like your uncle that embraces you in the barbecue. Um, they don't, they're not politically correct. They're never going to be politically correct. And they're, con- unfortunately, because of that's how they've been for so long, they're not going to understand how we are now in a society. So um, you're, in my opinion, you're kind of rolling the dice anytime they speak. And um, not that, you know, obviously Cornette's not even on TV anymore because of everything he's done. Whether it's him, but specifically uh, Jake for AEW, and um, even you know Jim, like Jim Ross has said a few things where I was just like, uh, I love Jim he Ross. Said, he death. said He's, one to this to this week that I'm gonna bring up. Okay, but I remember the one specifically. It had to do with with, with the Santana Ortiz about uh, these guys have been in handcuffs, and I was just like, uh, man, I I think that's the I could see, now, now if you talk to them, I think that's the characters they play. Yeah, I, no, I mean, I, I, I didn't have a problem with it. I, I, first of all, I think Jim Ross can do whatever he wants, in my opinion. I'll never hate that guy. I, he is my idol because I've always wanted to be an announcer and work behind the scenes. Um, I think, though, some people could say that's a little, uh, well, a little cringe, a little, maybe possibly a little racist. I, as being, as being a, a Mexican, I didn't have a problem with it. Um, but uh, when you have these, again, to, and I'll, uh, summarize real quickly. When you have these older guys, they're going to talk a certain way, and then that's never going to change. You you cannot you can teach old dogs some new tricks, but you can't teach them, you know, a bunch of new tricks. And you definitely can't teach somebody to be politically correct if they've been a certain way for so long. Um, to finalize, the one last thing I will say about Jake Roberts, his promos have been phenomenal. I'm just a little confused though because for me, the feud should be Cody and Lance, and I feel. Uh, the last few Jake this Jake Roberts promos seems to be closer to like almost a Memphis style where it's like Jerry Lawler versus Jimmy Hart stable of goons. And it's, and I feel like the, the feud is now getting a little bit closer to the Rhodes family versus Jake Roberts and not Jake versus Lance. I think Jake needs to do a better job pushing Lance as this monster heel and that if he's going to be his mouthpiece, I just think Lance is getting a little bit lost in this yeah, I completely agree. I've actually made that point on the show a few weeks ago is that he's cut a few he's cut like one or two promos where I think the point of the promo was to get uh Lance over and then it just seemed like it has done nothing but go away from that since then. Uh, this particular promo, he did talk about we a lot. Okay? And I have to give it to him that he did do a good job of saying we as in, you know, this is what we're going to do. And that's and that's good. Uh the thing about it is it you know I, I defend 
things that like Jerry Lawler, when people say things for heat, I defend it because I I defend wrestling. I think wrestling should be treated like all me, all other medium, right? People watch Law and Order. I always bring up this show, Law and Order SVU. I don't know. Do you have you you watch that show, right? I'm a big fan of Mariska Hargitay. Okay. The sick things the bad guys does do in those shows, right? You would say Absolutely. that goes further than anything a bad guy says in wrestling, right? Absolutely. And it's acceptable form of entertainment. Do we have people saying, that guy shouldn't be that bad. You should take that off of TV, right? You don't. Correct. Why do we do it in wrestling? I, I think with wrestling is... I think it, this is all up to interpretation. For me, I've never seen wrestling as a TV show. I've seen wrestling as in, as a medium between um, an entertainment product versus um, a sports product. And I think that's just my view. I think everybody's everybody's opinion is right on how they view wrestling. I've just never viewed it that way. I, I never okay. considered it to be a television show like you know, <laughs> anything, whether it's a, a sitcom or Law & Order. You know what? And you're the first person to explain it to me. And that's fair. It's a f- completely fair statement. I Wrestling has always been on my TV. It lives in a fictional world. You know what I mean? It, it, it lives in a fictional world. When someone bumps, in you, bumps into you, you fight them. You know? This, this is not how you handle things in real life. You know? Uh, uh, someone looks at you funny. Uh, what is it? Uh, Sheamus wants to beat Jeff Hardy up on SmackDown because Jeff Hardy's been getting too much attention. You know what I mean? That's to me not sports. That's a story. That's TV. You know, and that's how I've always I've always came at wrestling from the TV entertaining side. So when I see people complain about people saying stuff and he's like, "Oh, that's too far," and I'm just like, "It's an entertainment product. He's supposed to be an evil person." Evil people say evil things, and I think that's a fair. I think that's a fair comparison too, because <laughs> wrestling, since probably the Attitude Era, has been written as a television product. It has yeah. TV writers. I mean, for at one point, WWE had Freddie Prince Jr. writing for them. Yeah, um, and now all the writers they have, they have to have a television background. Um, and I'm not saying it, I'm not saying. It, it's it's sports like you know a combat sport or, or football i think when people see like for i'll say jake roberts and if you compare it to the tv show because i remember her name they don't when they hear uh, when they see mariska hargitay talking on law and order they're not they don't see that's mariska hargitay they see the fictional character of olivia benson when they hear jake roberts talking they don't see the fictional character of Jake Roberts, they see the real life person. Maybe because it's a live product um, versus a television, you know, television tape product um, that's set in a fictional world. I don't think a lot of people see wrestling set in a fictional world. Um, if they maybe if they did, then people wouldn't have those same criticisms. Possibly. Yeah. No, I uh, know, and, and you know, and I kind of you know, you painted in a different light. If just based on what you take wrestling from. I've never seen, I've seen wrestling, I see them as athletic actors. You know what I mean? That's what I see. I feel like anytime they're on my TV in the show, they are in character. Even when they say, this is a shoot, or this is not the character talking, they're still in character. As long as they're on my screen, they are in character. You know what I mean? So, yeah, Jake Roberts said that. You know what I, you know what I mean? And he said that about Brandy. But it's like, it was Jake Roberts, Jake the Snake, not, I, for, I, I forgot, I don't even think his real name is Jake Roberts. But, you know, it wasn't him saying it, you know, so I can I completely disassociate it. He could come out there and say, I hate black people. And I'd be like, oh, you hate black people. And it wouldn't phase me whatsoever because it's just a character talking. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I don't know. It's probably not the place for all that. It's just I get so it's to me it's like when people get upset about people saying stuff. It's just like it, to me it's different if you know that person is in his personal life saying his things that he hates or whatever, and you want to get outraged. Great, but anytime 
he's on TV, in my opinion, he's just a paid performer, not necessarily reading lines, but performing. So it doesn't matter, you know, necessarily what he says. And I, I don't, I, when I see it, I'm, I go like, I go, man, this may not go over well. But yeah. I, I personally don't get upset. And the reason why is because I want to be entertained by wrestling. Yeah. And there's a lot of other things I'm worried about. And before we got in the air, I talked about how, you know, my job's facing this significant multi-million dollar budget cut in the next year in higher education. So I have more, I have bigger issues I'm worried about than to be offended because of somebody saying something on a wrestling show. Yeah. Yeah. So and if, if you, if, if you get, if people get upset, Hey, you are one thing I learned a long time ago. I cannot tell you how to feel. If yeah. you feel that way, I support you, but yeah. I'm not going to get upset about it because I just have bigger fish to fry. My only thing I ever do is just point out, if you feel this way about this, why don't you feel the same way about some, you know, something similar? And it's just to me, when people are being entertaining on TV, they're just that. But I watch a lot of TV shows. So I guess that's why I'm like, I see stuff on the daily basis that, you know, I see stuff on the daily basis on TV that destroys anything I see on wrestling. You know what I mean? Wrestling is so low compared to the stuff I see on Chicago PD, uh, you know, Chicago PD, Law and Order SVU, anything like that. It's just nothing. People do so much worse things, and people are like, man, that's my favorite show. And it's just like wrestling says, and it's like, oh, that's so in bad taste. I'm like, I don't, I don't get why it's different, even though, like you explained to me how you see it, and I can put myself in your shoes, and I can see that, but I don't really necessarily see how it's a little how it's different but jake did his thing jake jake did his thing i know some people got offended some people don't i'm hoping it's the right kind of offended i hope you got offended to the point where you want lance archer to lose or jake roberts to get hit in the balls by brandy or something like that as opposed to i'm never watching this show again offended that's all i can hope i will say this i don't think i don't think people well, I know. Let me rephrase this. I know they did not get offended as some of the other stuff that was said about uh, women this week on um, um, in in wrestling because of um, what happened on the other show on Monday um, with Becky Lynch announcing her pregnancy. Oh yeah, oh so, yeah, yeah. Jim Cornette and, is... and the reason and the oh yeah and the reason being is that and you said the nail on the head. He's he's cutting a promo and everybody's like he said you know he did this because he had to get heat versus somebody's real life opinion. Yeah. And if your real life opinion is what Jim Cornette said about women, you need to rethink your life because I, that is horrendous. I don't know. I will say this, and I try not to give him too much attention. I don't know what Jim Cornette's real opinion is. I know it was it no. was it was a terrible take. No, I, I no I, I re- no I read that. I just don't know if that's his real opinion. His goal is to get your retweets. It's to get the people's likes. It's to get attention. That's what he does. I don't think, just like Howard Stern did back in the day, he would say the thing that offended you most so people would turn on to his radio show. The only way for that old man to stay relevant is to say really offensive shit. If he just comes out on his show and says, congratulations to Becky, I wish you the best in your life, do you get retweets, likes, and people talking about it if you just say that? I... You don't. No, I mean, you're 100 percent right. <laughs> yeah, hey. I, I mean, you're 100 percent right. I just, God, that no, just... It, it's horrible. But that's and, what you and, have and... to do to get people to talk about it. You're like, you can't be someone that is level-handed and just gives his opinions, and people pay attention to you. You will strongly be ignored. Let, uh, let's just move on because I don't want to give that guy attention because I, <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I unfortunately. I agree. Now, like I, I said, I am not defending him. I just don't know I, if that's his real opinion. No, I, 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 think I, I, I agree char- with you. He's a character. He's like, I don't even take him seriously because I think he's just doing shtick all the time. So, like, it's not that I forgive or whatever. I kind of just ignore him. The only reason I even saw it is because it got liked and retweeted so much on Twitter that I couldn't ignore it. I'll, I'll, I'll leave it with this. I think in general – and from in my 
for my opinion, is I think he unfortunately believes it for the single fact is that he doesn't have kids. And as somebody who's at the certain as the same age as Becky, Becky just turned thirty three. I'm thirty two. My wife's thirty one, and we're reaching that point. He doesn't understand the you know his comments about you you know people having babies at a certain age. Once you and I know this because my sister works in the medical field. Once you reach a certain age uh, for a female, um, it becomes very increasingly difficult to to have a child as well as the possibility of of, um, of different types of um, and the possibility of Down syndrome, things like that, could occur after the age of 35. And I can only know this because my sister works in the medical field and we're reaching that certain age, both my wife and I. And the fact that he's very ignorant because I'm, my assumption is that he doesn't have children of his own, he doesn't get it. And um, and I'll just leave it at that. It's just. All right. No, I mean, honestly, a lot of people don't know this about me. Uh, you know, everyone knows I'm married. The reason me and my wife aren't having kids is because we met so late in life. There would be so many complications with her getting pregnant and having a kid that we just decided, you know what, we're just going to enjoy our time together. That was just the decision we made. And, you know, like I said, I don't talk about that kind of a lot. But, yeah, we just made the decision that, you know what, I want my time with my wife more than I want a kid. And at her age, it would be increasingly difficult because we're both almost 40. Uh, it would be increasingly difficult uh, to have a kid. Let's just let's leave that this. Congratulations to Becky Lynch and Seth <laughs> Rollins, and I wish you guys the best with uh, yeah. it, with um, having a child. So yeah, absolutely, and, uh, absolutely, and, uh, I, I completely and so, agree um, with that. Uh, I, it, you know what? That's why I like. I try to focus on it being a joyous, positive moment, and you know what? Just call what everything else what it is. So then we get an AEW tag team division vignette where it basically resets the tag team division, lets you know the players in it. Currently, the number one contenders are the Dark Order. Uh, This pretty much sets up the fact that there won't be a tag match at Double or Nothing. We'll get to that later because, you know, the champions will be a little busy. Uh, Then we get the best friends beat Jungle Express when MJF attacks Jungle Boy. Chucky T then hits the awful waffle on Jungle Boy and gets the pin. During the match, uh, Orange Cassidy is at the top of the ramp. Looks like he's about to jump into the ring. He gets the the gif of the week when Ray Phoenix comes out of seemingly nowhere, but came from backstage, and jumps and gives him a Mortal Kombat-style kick to the face. That was a Liu Kang kick. Yes. I'm surprised that I I didn't think they said it, but I'm surprised no one said finish him because that was that was just insane. Yeah, I've seen this gift so many times, and all I do is laugh. Uh, sh- shout out to Ray Phoenix. Like I say, he does things that uh, I've never seen before all the time, but this was just hilarious and funny. Uh, War- Marco's uh, Warlow attacks Marco stunt after the match. Uh, Luchasaurus comes to his defense. Warlow and Luchasaurus have a stare down. I'm excited to see when we get a big man versus big man Luchasaurus match. So maybe it'll be with Warlow or whoever it'll be. That should be fun. Uh, hold, hold on though, but you, I mean, you mentioned that Warlow attacks Marco Stunt. He didn't attack Marco Stunt. He almost killed Marco Stunt. I felt so horrible for Marco. Wardlow picks him up and swings him into the barricade. It is one of the nastiest looking bumps I've ever seen. Yeah, Marco Stunt is uh he is the bump he, taker extraordinaire. Uh, they I, need I, to get they need to settle down because between after this, his matches with um with Brody Lee, his match with um Lance Archer, where Lance threw him into the crowd and I think Austin Gunn barely caught him, um, as well as uh, Orange Cassidy. He is He's been taking a little bit of a beating for the last few months and very crazy bumps. And, um, you know, I love I love Jurassic Express. Jurassic Express for me is the best tag team that AEW has introduced me to. I love the uh, the dynamic of Luchasaurus, Jungle Boy. I love Marco Stud being part of them. I think the three of them together are amazing. But if they don't stop, they're going to kill Marco Stud. <laughs> um. Yeah, uh, he, he he takes some killer bumps. He does take some uh, killer bumps, and I love it. I mean, that's what he's there for. Like, I mean, I'm one of those people that when they said they signed him, I was like, why? And now I, I mean, 
I am seeing the vision. He's there to get chunked. That's that's his job, and that's a it, great job. It, and he's he does his job well. And also the for those that criticize, um, and I'm not saying that you you criticize it. But I did, I did criticize it. So yes, I will listen. <laughs> but <when> you... <laughs> but my comparison to Marco is uh, to me, Marco is the same. Um, he's actually a better version than when WWE had uh, Ellsworth. Because I, to this day, I don't understand why they had other work to be good with. I just, I mean, and again, I never fault anybody for making a paycheck. I don't want anybody to be unemployed, especially right now. But I see Marco, and I just think that he fits so well with Jurassic Express. And I um, and I don't know why. I just like the, the way they look. I think, if anything, I feel like he makes he makes Jungle Boy seem bigger. He possibly. does, I think that's definitely. Where which I think maybe that's why I feel like he makes, uh, I think if it was just jungle boy and Luchasaurus, I feel that Luchasaurus would get, you know, the shine. And I think with jungle boy and Marco, that jungle boy seems like just a, a bigger character because he has a great look, but unfortunately he is small too. But I think that just helps jungle boy so much. So I think that's probably why I like it. So I just never under I don't understand now, like if people are so criticizing Marcos on now, I don't get it because we've we've seen this before in other organizations, and he fits so well with Jurassic Express. I think if actually Mark Marco leaves Jurassic Express, I think it actually hurts Jungle Boy. Yeah, I, like I said, I see his spot now. I see what he's there for. He makes anybody, uh, anybody um, that's having these uh, like problems. Or if you want the guy to look like a real monster, you put him in there with Marco Stunt. It works. It's I I, I see his purpose. It makes he makes every squash match better. All right, the next match we got was the Fatal Four Way with Penelope uh, Ford, Chris Statlander, Britt Baker, and Sheeta Karashita. Uh, the finish came when Hikaru Shida, uh, Britt Baker kind of goes crazy on Chris Statlander on the outside, starts attacking her, and then puts her in her, uh, mandible claw, uh, maneuver on the outside with her glove on. Because she is distracted and pissed off at Chris Statlander, we then get Hikaru Shida, who hits that low knee on Penelope Ford, gets the win, and uh, Rick, it keeps attacking Chris Stantlander after the match. Uh, it was announced during the match, number one contender. Uh, Hakara Shida kept her number one contender spot. Therefore, she will be uh, fighting Nyla Rhodes at uh, pay-per-view. Uh, I don't know, like, I in my notes, I didn't put it in order. But I don't know where the Nyla Rhodes came, thing came in. If you remember, just throw it in when it does come in, okay? Um, I, I feel like it came in after, um, after the, like the next two matches. Yeah, that's what I thought. Um, I thought it was a good, I thought there was some time between. Because Uh they, I feel like they announced the match and then came the promo. No, no, no. It was the promo, then they announced that the match, but they uh, announced there was a no disqualification. Okay. Uh, then uh, this is uh, saying. Then we get uh, my uh, match of the night. The match I was looking most forward to this week was Santana Ortiz against Kenny and uh, Kenny Omega and Matt Hardy. It was a good, solid match. Uh, the end of the match came in. Uh, uh, Omega used a V trigger on Ortiz, and then Hort- uh, 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 Hardy followed up with the twist of fate. And that uh, dropped him on his head for the win. So that was Matt Hardy and Kenny Omega. What did you think of the actual match before we go on into the end results of the match? I, I, I like the match. I think it was a great match. They're both for her incredible talents. And I've. Um, it's funny to me, um, the criticisms that Omega gets now, um, from certain fans, they feel like he's like, oh, he's not the he's not the Omega of New Japan. I think people forget that Kenny Omega's been wrestling for I think last time I checked it was over like twenty years or over twenty years. And I'm like Kenny Omega, you know he's 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 a vet. He's one of the longest, you know, has the longest tenure in wrestling, one of the longest tenures of wrestling as everybody uh, in, in the entire AEW roster. And I think what he's doing, he's doing a great job. He's giving back to AEW, giving back to talents. He doesn't need to be, he doesn't always need to be the best bout machine anymore. He He's 
what he needs to he's that bad i and this i know i'll say it and i'm gonna get criticism it's whatever he what he does for that organization is the same thing as what other guys like a rick flair who's been you know or triple h somebody's been there such a long time and they're giving back to the younger the younger talent giving back to the organization because i'm willing to I'm and this is I'm gonna bet because it's true. He has less matches in front of him than he has behind him. So I don't know how much longer Kenny Omega has as far as wrestling. Maybe it's four or five years, but they forget that he's been wrestling for such a long time and grinding to get to where he became the best bout machine. And now that he's an AEW, he doesn't have to do all that and he's helping the younger generation and i think the last and in addition to that i would also say um as great as the match was i need hangman back adam page and omega i need them back together i love hardy but it's time for our uh, hangman omega tag team to come back together yeah this was a great tag match uh but i agree with you a hangman and omega versus proud and powerful would have been better uh my biggest complaint and of course i gotta have a complaint because uh, I enjoyed the match. I enjoyed everything. I, the big thing is we just had a vignette talking about AEW being the best tag division in the world, right? Yes. Why don't established tag teams beat non-established tag teams? Yeah, and it, it is, I mean, as frustrating as I'm making it to be, which is not to, uh, for me, again, I would try to watch wrestling to be entertained, but Santana Ortiz coming over and being – probably one of the biggest tag teams that wasn't signed by any organization at the time. Yeah. And they are essentially playing second fiddle to Sammy and Jericho and then as in in a circle and as well as they're losing to the makeshift tag team of o- Omega and Hardy. And again, Omega's such a great talent, best spout machine. He's um and I looked up again he's a twenty year vet, Hardy had been wrestling since he was, what, 17, 18 years old in those jobber matches for WWF back in the mid-90s. Uh, mid um, but how much how much better would it have been if Santana Ortiz won, especially, and we'll get to what's going on for Double or Nothing um, after the Jericho match, but how much more heat does that just add to Omega, to the inner circle, if they just beat Omega and, and Hardy? Even if there was some sort of fluke, you know, you know, Hager came out and just knocked out, you know, Omega or something like that. And, yeah, I think um, definitely Santana Ortiz, in my opinion, should have went over. I think Santana Ortiz, I actually think they should have lost via DQ. And then that way they're not getting a clean pinfall. I understand why Matt Hardy and Kenny Omega needed to win. But I just like them taking the clean one, two, three over an established tag team. It's just... As a person that loves tag team wrestling, that's why it bothers me. If it doesn't bother anyone else, I get it. I'm not telling it to bother you. I'm not trying to drum up controversy. I'm just saying as a person that loves tag team wrestling, the established tag team in, in your in your company is being different. The established tag team should beat makeshift tag teams. It's just absolutely it's just like so okay, Chris Jericho and Sammy Guevara are good enough to beat Kenny Omega and Kenny Omega and Matt Hardy. But Proud and Powerful, the team that you were pushing to, you know, tag team title shots as one of these big entrants aren't good enough to beat them. That's how I look at it. I'm like, I know wins and losses are very flexible in wrestling. I just, man, I just like, I just love, for, it's it's more of my love for Proud and the Powerful that's coming out right now than anything else. Just well, logically, I- it didn't make sense. I, I just think if you would have done something like Hager and Ortiz or Hager and Santana, I think that would have made more sense as long as it wasn't proud and powerful. Well, I'll, I'll also add this to, I'll, um, to for those who maybe criticize your take, and, I'll, and I'm going to defend your take, is that one of the things is as great as Omega and Hardy is, we talk about tag teams, we talk about tag team chemistry. And even though, they t- you know, you look at this amazing, you know, over 40 years of combined experience between Omega and Hardy, they're not a tag team that have teamed up together for years like Santana and Ortiz. And there's something to be said that that's part of the advantage for Santana and Ortiz that they should have won is that as great as Omega and Hardy is in their experience, they're not experienced tag teams, and the experienced team should be able to beat a makeshift tag team. 
Yeah. Whether it's whether it's you know uh, Hardy and Omega or you know John Doe and James Anderson. You know? Yeah. Yeah. That's all I'm saying. It's just I would love the tag teams to take the spotlight. Even the tag team champions right now is a makeshift tag team. You have one of the best tag team divisions in the world, and your tag team champions are. <laughs> Excuse me. Two non tag team wrestlers. It's just it's I don't huge. know. It shouldn't bother me. It does though. Yeah, so uh, then we move on to MJF. He taps out Lee Johnson. Uh he uh, puts him in the arm breaker and taps him out. He says uh he need he he didn't feel quite ready. He needs a warm-up match, and he wasn't talking about Lee Johnson to get ready for the Jungle Boy because he's got a little ring rust. And he said he saw an open contract in the back to wrestle Marco Stunt. So next week we're going to have MJF and Marco Stunt. How great is MJF? Yeah, he is really, really, really good. It's just... I I have this, I have this like six-month feud in my head with MJF to get Cody back in... To somehow get the title, you know, Cody says he'll never get the AEW championship. But after Revolution, I just I already have this thing planned out because, especially on lockdown and working from home, I'm just I just love MJF, and he's just a dastardly heel. He's despicable. He is a true heel. There's nobody like him in today's wrestling. He's just phenomenal, and I hate him for being so despicable. And yeah, MJF is the greatest heel in wrestling today. I don't care what he says. And that's absolutely true. Uh, we had two interviews. Uh, they happened before this match, but so I'm going a little out of order. Taz interviewed Darby Allen. Taz apologized. <laughs> well, I love that segment. Yeah, he apologized to Darby uh, for his interview loss last week. Uh, then Allen, <coughs> he was telling him, excuse me, got the coughs a little bit. Okay. Sinuses. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's uh, honestly, it's allergies. Uh, lots of dust in the house when you're at home more than you're used to. So it's weird. Uh, so he apologized to Darby for his interview last week. Kept bringing up Darby's loss to Cody, and he was talking about him basically pinning himself. And then Darby told him, "Taz, you don't get it. Back in the day, I placed third in the state of Idaho in amateur wrestling." Uh, and then he walked off. Uh, so apparently he has an amateur wrestling background. He just pinned himself. Lexi interviewed Sheeta about her upcoming match for the title with Nyla. Nyla interrupted the interview and said, I got a present for you. Said Nyla, then uh, he got a present for you. And then she hits Sheeta in the head with her kendo stick. It was I then... It was then announced that uh, Sheeta and Sheeta and Nyla Rose is going to be a no DQ match at uh, Double or Nothing. This is a match I've been looking forward to for a while, and the reason why is in the beginning I felt that the the women's division uh, lived and breathed with Nyla and Bert Baker. Um, I felt that they were. I think just Bert was a great prospect, and I felt Nyla was a today's uh, version of Austin Kong, who I loved Austin Kong. I've always been into big monster heels. I you know, like the Andre the Giant and Big John Stug, King Kong Bundy type. And I think it's because I grew up as a big kid. So as soon as I saw Nyla, I was just enamored because it's just a big physical specimen. And the you've been mar- marked for death and there isn't a beast like me. I, I love everything. I love everything about Nyla. I love her on Twitter. She's such a she's such a comedic, um, especially her tweet about that pineapple pea was in her house and she had pineapple pea a uh, pineapple with glasses on it. Um, but I've been looking forward to this match, and I tell people I think this is a, a could be a version of Gail Kim versus Awesome Kong. I think that they could have a great dynamic. I'm a really big fan of Sheeta as well. Um, I wasn't into Riho and Emi Sakura as much as other people were. Um, I, as soon as I saw Sheeta, I just felt that Sheeta was money, and I think this is going to be a really great match. Um, I don't know if you put if moving to a double or nothing if you put the take the belt off Nyla. I wouldn't. I think um, I think there's more money to be made with Nyla having being the dastardly heel and destroying the women, and then eventually you have. Um, 
after a six month reign, somebody ends up coming off and and knocking um, off the hill, the hill champion that is Nyla. Um, even if it's Sheeta later, I just think that I would rather have Sheeta or somebody else chase Nyla instead of Nyla losing the belt, especially because she's just. I mean, I I don't know what it is. I just love Nyla. Just everything. She's just a powerful monster heel, and she's just I think just amazing. And she's really only had one defense because of the corona. It's just so yeah. I I think her and Sheeta should have a great match, but. I think it, when it comes down to it, uh, it should be uh, Nyla coming out with the wins. I mean, we're talking about some stuff we we haven't got to yet, but hey, still fun. Let's talk about. It. Mm-hmm. So yeah, uh, no, I am definitely uh, I'm definitely with you on that. I just don't I don't I just don't think it's time for her to lose yet. Um, let's see. All right, then we have. The for Jericho versus Pineapple Pete. It was funny because on this show, this was probably the most anticipated match. The most anticipated squash match in history. Uh, Jericho and Pete get started. Pete throws Jericho against the ropes. Uh, against, gets him in the corner. Lays an elbow. Gets him in another corner. Lays an elbow. Goes for it the third time. Jericho. Uh, Judas effect. Pin. One, two, three. Jericho quickly dispatches a pineapple Pete. I love the run. They gave you that moment of excitement where you think Pete's going to do something, and Jer- just qu- Jericho just quickly dispatches of him. You know, it's like 15 minutes of fame over. Boom! J- Judas effect. And he took it. It was. It's probably going to go down as one of the all-time great Judas effects. If you did I, not um, see this show, make sure you go watch just that move. I'm I'm not gonna lie. I was I was really disappointed. I was so bummed out. Um, I, I I as we talked about earlier about the, uh, during the road to double double nothing and pineapple P segment. I'm just big. I'm a big pineapple P fan, and I I don't know. I may I just felt that I just felt they got it wrong. I'm sorry. Like I think I think if even if they could have had a fluke. And I look back to when um, the idea I had in my mind was years a WCW Nitro. They talk about this match that Scott, Scott Hall had with Chris Jericho. And Chris Jericho was like a young up-and-comer. He may have been a career champion at one point, but he wasn't at the time. And Scott Hall was supposed to squash Jericho. Scott Hall was the NWO. And Jericho said, it means more to Jericho to establish him if I if he beats me. And it was going to be a fluke win anyways. And I just felt like, if they, if they even if it was a fluke and somebody interfered in the match and beat and so. Pete can get one over on Jericho. I think that establishes Pete as a as a talent for AEW, and for him to lose as quickly as he did, I've never been more disappointed in a situation of wrestling um, since the Undertaker streak ended, as I was a pineapple Pete losing. That's yeah. how disappointed I was. It made Jericho more of a heel in your eyes. You like hate Jericho a little bit, right? I I I mean, I just. I didn't really hate Jericho more. I didn't hate Jericho more. I it wasn't that I hated him more. I just hated the fact that Pineapple Pete lost. Yeah. I that's what I I was just I didn't I was I had disappointment in my heart. I didn't. That's all I felt was just disappointment. Yeah, and it's like yeah, he's he like Jericho was the dream crusher and he crushed it with an elbow. And I'm just saying Jericho is the former world champion that has only lost one singles match in AEW. He should not take that long to beat Pineapple Pete. I think it was the right booking decision based on where they're from. And I think uh, it was even more of a good booking decision based on based on what was announced next. Jericho's in the ring. He, he says, we want to challenge. The only thing bigger than we can do bigger than what we did last week is we want a, 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 a fight in front of 80, you know, in an 80,000 stadium, 80,000 person stadium. So we got the stadium stampede. He challenged the elite and Matt Hardy to the, the stadium stampede. I hope I'm saying this correctly. Uh, so it looks like it's going to be, of course, Jericho, uh, Santana Ortiz, Sammy G, and Jake Hager uh, against the uh, against the elite. Uh, Vanguard one flow up flies in. And uh, he uh, based they asked, did he accept? Vanguard one accepted on behalf of the elite. Uh, Jericho then asked 
Uh, was he going to join the Dark Order? Van Gord one, of course, turned him down. He's like, yep, we already knew that was going to be your answer. So uh, I've only introduced you to the new member of the uh, new member of the inner circle. In a, you got some heat. In a you point, got heat. A point that warmed the cockles of my soul. He introduced him to Floyd the baseball bat. Now, out of all the names in the world Jericho could have picked, there's a lot of them. The Floyd the baseball bat. I don't get it. I laughed, and everybody's like, Floyd, you turned on Cody. I was like, oh, hold on. Hold on. Yeah, you got some heat. I saw some people coming after you. Uh, hold on. If you're doing the math right, Cody's already in a match. So I can't have turned on Cody because Cody's not going to be in the stadium stampede. Right? I mean, just mad. Of course. He's fighting Lance Archer. So – if you know, if you're going based on that, it's going to be the Young Bucks. It's going to be uh, hopefully Nick is healthy. We get Kenny Omega. We're going to get the Hangman, and we're going to get Matt Hardy. That's that's what it the, looks like to me. That's going to be the five. So I did not turn on Cody. I turned on the Elite, Floyd. I'm just saying. Not I'm only just did saying. you turn on the Elite, you destroyed Vanguard One, and you will forever be a heel in the eyes of AEW fans now. To all the people one. out there that thinks Vanguard One is cheesy, I am a hero to them. But I know I know that's a thing. And <laughs> just know, just know, in real life, if you ever need that work done, you call me. <laughs> you call Floyd. I, I hundred percent success rate. There was a Vanguard One when I was done. It's not a Vanguard One anymore. That's all I got to say. <laughs> oh, undefeated. Un- undefeated, against undefeated against inanimate objects. Undefeated against inanimate objects. We have the AW fan is two and oh. Mm-hmm. Our or well, the heart of the elite, one well, of the people I love the most, all Lee Tiffany, undefeated in AEW. Floyd is now the second undefeated member of the AEW family in AEW. We have two members, both undefeated in AEW. Yes, Jericho knows you <laughs> need work done. Call Floyd. He he handles that business. He went straight. He went, you know, Tanya, Hart, Tanya Harding on Vanguard one with Floyd. Yes. Yeah, I had to. I had to. Everybody did. I mean, that bat was passed around. Every, I mean, Vanguard one was was plastic pieces by the time it was, they were done. Sammy went ham. Everybody went ham with that baseball bat. Yes, we need the next level. Vanguard One needs to go into the, I think it was the Lake of Rejuvenation, and uh, come back anew. But that's the match we got. The main event was Brody Lee versus Chris Daniels. It was a match, and Brody Lee won. And then Mox came out to attack the uh, Dark Order. He took people out. He took all the members of Dark Order out. Brody Lee actually literally threw one guy to sacrifice them to John Moxley, and then Brody Lee left with the belt. I mean, it was a decent match. I've heard complaints that it lasted too long, Brody Lee. I do think he should have beat Chris Daniels a little bit more definitively, but there is a main event standard in AEW that like main events go at least 10 minutes, you know what I mean? So mm-hmm. I think they stuck with the main event standard. That was a good idea. So I'm going to start in with these two questions for you, sir. What do you think? How excited are you for the stadium stampede, sir? I love gimmick matches. I, I just, I'm obsessed with them. I want complete utter chaos. I want, I want pinfalls on the 50 yard line. I want them in the, I want them in the stands. I want them in the concessions. I want them in the owner suite. Wherever they can go, I want five different brawls. I want 20 different camera angles. I want the works in this match. I expect complete great chaos in this. And when you have the talent involved as they do, um, and I tell you this, I was never a big Jericho fan. And coming as the more he came into AEW and what he's done, I'm a, I wouldn't say I'm a fan of Jericho. I appreciate Jericho so much now. More, I, I not that he. I didn't think he was a good wrestler before. I just appreciate everything he's done for AEW, what he's done building up a guy like Sammy Guevara. When I saw Sammy Guevara at Double or Nothing against Kip, 
I think it was Kip Sabian in, the, in one of the pre-show matches. I was like, this kid got something. And then when he joined Inner Circle, I've been uh, Darby Allen, Sammy Guevara, Jurassic Express are my guys, the AW guys that I that introduced me to that I really do a big enjoy them quite a bit. And, um, and then also on the other side with Hardy, Omega, the Young Bucks, and Hangman, I just think it's gonna be great. I don't. The, the rules I'm assuming are there are no rules and balls can take anywhere. So who knows? Um, who knows what's gonna happen? But I think this is gonna be just greatness in the stadium. Yeah, my big thing is with this whole thing is they're going to entertain. They're going to do stuff you've never seen before. They're going to have fun with it. And the winner is going to matter. You know, whether the inner circle, there are going to be repercussions. Whether the inner circle or the elite win, there's going to be ongoing repercussions going forward. They're going to play out on Dynamite, and I'm looking forward to it. I expect something. I expect, as you said, repercussions. I I suspect something significant is is going to come out of this that's going to alter the course of either the elite or the inner circle. Yeah, I don't know what it is, but something significant has to come out of this. Yeah, um, the only thing I would be worried about is how it would eventually when we come back is how does this potentially affect blood, blood and guts is. Not that we won't get blood and guts, but maybe we may not have the same match of blood and guts. When oh, we yeah, we're definitely going to get a different match for blood and guts. Yeah. I think whatever the ending for blood and guts was, it's going to be, that's pretty much going to be the ending. Because I thought blood and guts was going to set up stories going forward. And I think that's what the stampede is going to do. And we might get some debuts or whatever. There are no rules. We'll see. I am looking forward to it going, uh, you know, after this. Um, Box and... Just, whoever, whoever, I'm sorry, one more thing. Whoever came up with it, and my assumption is going to be Jericho and Tony Khan as they came up with it, they deserve a race. I do talk about out of out of everything we come out of this pandemic and they're having to continue to make changes. The brilliant idea of this is should not just be overlooked, that they are making... As the saying goes, chicken salad on chicken shit. And I commend them for them coming up with the best. Double or nothing is obviously completely different than what it would have been because of the pandemic. And what they've done because of the pandemic and making changes to double or nothing has been brilliant. And I really commend them for giving everything they have to make it a, a top-notch, high-quality pay-per-view. Absolutely. Absolutely. I definitely commend them on that. Now, I do have a question, and I, again... Uh, I want your thoughts before I give my thoughts. Mox and Brody Lee for the world title. What do you think about that as that being the world title match for a double or nothing? Um, you know, when Brody Lee coming in, it was such a big deal because of being the leader of the, exalt, the, the exalted one leader of the Dark Order. Um, he just has such a great look. He's a monster. And I know some of the negativity, the 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 Twitter trolls are going to say is that, oh, this is, you know, we've seen this before and they're taking, this is like WCW. I don't, I just don't see it that way. I feel like the Mox character is completely different than what he was in his, in his previous organization he worked for. Um, and the same thing with Brody Lee. Um, I think it's going to be a great match. I think they can give it um, their top talent. And, and my question would be is, okay, if it's not Brody Lee, who would it be? And, and, I don't expect Brody Lee to beat Mox, but and I think this will help solidify Mox as continue being champion. Because if it wasn't Brody Lee, then who's he gonna face? Is it gonna was it gonna be MJF? Well, he beats MJF probably. So then you kill MJF. I just think Brody Lee is the right the right character at the right time for this for Mox to go into double or nothing. Um, the only thing I'd be worried about is that he is Brody Lee um, would end up dropping back down. To like, for lack of a better, you know, areas being in the mid card with um, the Dark Order, um, but I like it. He's he's one of their. I mean, if we look at the big heels, um, if it's not the Inner Circle and it's not MJF, who's I don't see a bigger hill for Mox to go against at Double or Nothing. Yeah, it, it's one of those things. I am. I don't think Brody Lee has been built up enough, long enough. To be getting this title shot, if you would have, t- they would have built up. Brody Lee would have fought like if that Daniels match would have happened at the pay per view, right? And he won mm-hmm. decisively. And then over the next 
six or whatever dynamites, he just beats everybody. Maybe he you put him against Frankie K. Maybe you put him in a match against Luchasaurus, and he just keeps winning. I think and building up his character, and then he had that signature great match. It would set him up to face Mox at like all out. I just think double to nothing is too early. I don't think he's been built up enough. I don't think the WWE stink is off of him yet. Oh, absolutely not. And he is still playing. He is still playing uh, this um, Vince McMahon character, which I wouldn't say get rid of it, but I just like I would like to see it as more of a threat, or more of a. Uh, the Dark Order is taking over. Maybe the Dark Order become tag team champions. Maybe they get someone that you weren't expecting them to get. But I want him to seem like more of a threat. Right now, he seems like a carryover champion, and Mox is going to win, and there is no intrigue on that match at whatsoever. I, I will say this, um, and I've never been a fan of the main event not being... I mean... Um, the, the stadium the stampede title. is going to be the last match. Yeah, so I'm saying so. Um, so with that being said, is that the stadium stampede will be the main or should be the main event, um, and I'm comfortable with this being the co-main. And then just looking at, I just look at the roster, and I just don't see anybody else to for Mox to beat that won't bury that won't bury Mark um, that will not bury that competitor that Mox beats. Um, and that's just me looking at the roster. I think it's basically the the best case scenario because my assumption is that who the um the winner of the ladder match is gonna be who mox faces that all out and i expect that one to be to tear down the house main event top-notch match and um then i, I thought i named the person that was announced a while ago was darby allen well a lot of people want to see darby allen versus mox and if that was for at double or nothing i wouldn't expect darby allen to beat mox i think that actually would bury darby allen so i think that Brody lee could um if i'm just foreshadowing is gonna would take the loss and it won't hurt him and then we get them back into the tag team area and this would just allow mox to continue his reign if it was the main event i wouldn't if it was the main event it would be really bad I, i mean not bad it wouldn't be a good match it would just be a really bad stink that i don't think people would like yeah, I, I, I don't uh, – it's – like I said, it's kind of like they're in a situation that I don't like for them because if they would have had the big entrance in Buffalo or something like that, maybe you build up the match better if you had the live Dynamites. It's just they're kind of stuck in the situation. And it's just when, when you finally get the title on somebody you want the title on, like Moxley – you want him to have good storylines going forward. And it just feels like this isn't one, but maybe, you know, maybe the I, the match, I think you're going to get a hell of a match because you're going to get Brody Lee versus uh, Mox, not Ambrose versus Luke Harper. And I think they're going to kill it. It's just, it's one of those things you're going to go in with low expectations and hopefully they pleasantly exceed them. So. I agree. Yeah, so um, hopefully that's that's what I'm looking for. Uh, that was it for Dynamite. I uh, May 13th. I thought it was overall a decent to good episode. Uh, the taped episodes aren't nearly what the live episodes are, and it, this was a great place for a tape episode, so they can have the live episode this Wednesday the 20th on my little sister Cynthia's birthday. What what happy 30 third birthday to Cynthia she her birthday is exactly three weeks before mine so our birthday's always on the same actual day of the week every year it's crazy you said that uh, my sister's birthday is the 20th too she'll be 35 oh that's kind of awesome but yeah we, our birthdays are so close yeah. together we are always three weeks apart and so uh, happy birthday happy early birthday to your sister yeah and a happy birthday to your sister also <laughs> yeah so yeah uh yeah, so I'm excited about that. Her show, I told her her birthday is on a Wednesday. That's the great, the greatest day of the week. So that's a good day. That's a good sign for your birthday. I want to just throw this out here. I don't, you know, I don't know how many people listen to our show. I actually don't pay attention to numbers a lot. I just, I appreciate everyone that does. But if Tony Khan or anybody from AEW happens to be listening to the show, 
man, you know, bringing people in the audience, live audience, you know, you got to have a low number. June 10th, June 10th of this year sounds like a great day to bring fans back. Just saying. That would be the ultimate birthday gift. You don't even Uncle have to Tony, eat. I co sign it. Uncle yep. Tony, I'm co signing it. Right. June like, 10th, let's do it. Yeah, I was like, you got a little less, you got a little, like a, almost a month to get ready for it. Say, man, we're bringing the audience back on June 10th. I know you can't sell it out, but, you know, limited tickets available. Do what you do. You know, I will be in there first row right next to Nasty Leroy tearing our asses off. I, you know, uh, if, well, I'll say this, and I say this all the time, and I'm sure that, uh, and I, you know, people, I'm not going to mention any names, but those people who know, and you're one of them, I love you guys so much because you make me a better fan and you guys make me a better person. Um, you know, we talk about positivity, um, and I just love you guys so much because um, I feel like I became a better person in the last year knowing you guys. Um, I, I and I have I have no problem um, saying this. I I had I dealt with some you know mental health issues, and I've I've talked to a counselor and stuff like this. But some of the best medication I've ever had is just interacting with you guys, the AW family, because you guys make me. Um, in a better place, both spiritually and mentally. And uh, I just love you guys, and I can't wait for AEW to come back in person so we can have audiences so we can all get together and just uh, be around each other and just have a good time. Yeah, I can't wait for them to come to your neck of woods. I can't wait for them to come out to California. I only The only time I've been to California was uh, WrestleMania 31. Uh, I have been looking forward to the Young Bucks returning home to their it's California roots, and I wanted to be there for it. So hopefully that happens. And you know it's funny because I uh, I've read this thing, and John saying it's like you are the sum of the five people that you are around the most. And you know I used to think that was BS, and then I realized how true that is. When, you know, when I started adding more positive people in, in my life, more people that focused on the good side of things instead of the realist or pessimistic side of things, they're like, man, this is going to work out. Man, this is going to do this. You're going to kill it. And you be there for each other. I've just noticed how much my outlook on life changed. Because when you are in certain parts of the wrestling fan base, you do get into that everything sucks line of thinking. And no matter what it is, they'll find out what they don't like about it, and that's what they want to focus on. And it's just, it, you don't understand how much being positive and being a light, like I have with Tiffany, like I have with Amy, like I have with you, how that, how being a light is a state of mind. I always tell people, I have to work to be positive. You know, it's not just all the sunshine. I see everything that's bad. I just chose to focus on what is good. And I hope every, I'm not saying everyone's going to do that because, you know, some people just aren't built that way. But that's just, I'm just telling you, it has made a difference in my life. Uh, I, I, I know everyone should do what, you know, best for your mental health. I have found putting more positive in my life has made me a more positive and happier person. One of the things I've done, and I actually started it this week, I, I've always been as positive as possible, especially wrestling. I've never talked negative about wrestling because to me it's it's my hobby. And I may get just, I would say, disappointed. I don't get angry or or, or and things like that. Um, with the, I just real quickly, with the whole thing that happened on Monday with Becky Lynch and just seeing people's responses negatively, um, I started like, I started just putting stuff like how, you know, you guys shouldn't be this way. And I started being like, cause I was very, very upset. Cause I just thought it was horrendous that people would talk about somebody's personal life. And then I realized, you know, this doesn't, this isn't fair to the people that follow me and the one and that we fall back each other. So I've done say beginning Tuesday and I've done a really good job with this. I'm not going to talk about anything negative anymore. Um, I'm just going to, you know, keep positive thoughts and putting positive vibes out there. Um, because I don't want people seeing that and then that affecting them in any way. So, um, and then again, it's because of the people you said and other people out there that I really admire. So from that's what I'm trying to do on a new outlook is just we're only going to talk about positive stuff. And if there's stuff out there that trolls do, you know what? I'm going to pay you no attention because we're going to keep it positive. We're going to keep it 100. 
that way and we need that right now especially in still in the face of this pandemic we need as much positivity out in the world yeah absolutely absolutely uh just going over a few things uh they've announced the competitors for the casino ladder match one was darby allen two colt cabana three orange cassidy for Phoenix, this might not have been the correct order. Let me make sure I believe it is, but whatever. Five, Scorpio Sky. Six, Kip Sabian. Seven, Frankie Kazarian. Eight, which was announced while we were recording the show, Luchasaurus. Uh, I am looking forward to it. If you don't know the rules, two people will start. Every 90 seconds, another person will come in. Uh, you can climb the ladder and get the belt at any time. So being the ninth person will have an advantage and a disadvantage. Advantage is you'll be the freshest person coming in. Disadvantage is the match might be over by the time you get in. So I am looking forward to all of these people. I believe only the only person on this. No, no one on this list has gotten a title shot. Because I know right. Scorpio wrestled, wrestled Chris Jericho, but I don't think it was for the title. I don't think. No, I think it. I think it was a title shot. Hold on a second. It was so long ago, but I feel like because he was given the title shot because he pinned Jericho in that tag team match. Yeah, so maybe it was a championship match. Well, he was the only person on this list that actually yeah. got a title match. Uh, so whoever gets a challenge will be a new uh, opponent for either uh, Mox or uh, Brody Lee. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, going forward, uh, who do you the, think is the ninth pick? Uh, ninth. I'll go first. I, I think I'm going to go with Wardlow just because of the start down with Luchasaurus. Maybe I'm going to go with Pentagon because Pentagon. Uh, if he lives, if I'll, well, yeah, obviously, I hope he's able to get out of Mexico. That's what I heard is that he's stuck in Mexico. I'm not sure if that's true or not, but um, I, if I'll, that's I, yeah, I hope he can get out and uh. I mean, I just picked. I picked Pentagon. Let's see who else makes sense. No, that's pretty much who makes sense because Jungle Boy's facing MJF. So I'd say it's either going to be Pentagon or Wardlow. Wardlow would be fun because he's going to chunk some people in that match. I expect people getting thrown off that ladder, yeah. hurled into an empty audience. Yes, and it'd be funny if he like won it and then like MJF tried to con him out of the number one contenders match. Uh, I agree 100 I think <laughs> I mean they just have an interesting dynamic and you know eventually people are going to want that big band to turn against MJF very similar to when Diesel turned against Shawn Michaels yes and the preview for next week uh, we got some exciting we're going to have Arn Anderson and Jake Roberts face to face interview on Wednesday May 20th we're going to have MJF versus Marco Stunt we're going to have Orange Cassidy versus Phoenix, which I'm very excited for because you got a man that does everything versus the man that does nothing. <laughs> then we have uh, Matt Hardy versus Sammy G. I think this was originally going to take place at the Matt Hardy compound. Now it's going to take place on Dynamite. And last but not least, we got the AEW World Champion, John Moxley versus Preston Vance, a.k.a. 10. I just have a feeling that's going to go on first. And there, you're going to get more builds because everybody that's available will be in town on the 20th because they're coming in on the 20th and then they're going to stay until the 23rd for Double or Nothing. And then, which Double or Nothing may or may not be live, I don't know. And then uh, I think they'll it'll be live up, to us. Yeah, it'll be live to us. And then they'll end up staying through the next episode. So we got another exciting episode of dynamite i am looking forward to the Aaron anderson jake roberts thing more than anything what is your most anticipated thing of the next episode i mean that to i'll pick a different one but i mean two of the greatest talkers in the history of wrestling jake roberts and Aaron anderson that'd be that's just gonna be phenomenal um i'm gonna go with hardy versus sammy Guevara. you know hardy's the veteran such a great wrestler sammy that little bastard heel that he is and i just love him and i think he's so he's great at the role that he plays and um you know this is just going to further uh, set up the stadium stampede so i really look forward to uh to that match 
Yeah, uh, I'm looking. Uh, that's going to be a great match. I'm going to uh, Phoenix and uh, Orange Cassidy's dynamic is going to be something interesting to me also. I don't know. I, I explained this because uh, I think Amy had she's tweeted something about Orange Cassidy. I, I don't know why I love Orange Cassidy. I think it's just I'm fascinated. I think more for me is just I could tell he's such a great athlete. And the fact that he doesn't use it, I just think is hilarious to me. Um, I think I just, I, yeah, he's another guy that I like. And I always said the thing I love about AEW is that there's something for everybody. I, you know, I'm not a big fan of like, you know, the Jimmy Havoc and Joey Janela death matches, but there are people that are fans of that and I get it and I don't have a problem with it. And that's what Orange Cassidy to me is I've never been a fan of comedy type wrestling and, but I've, he made me a fan of his style and I like it a lot. I just think he's hilarious. All right. Well, thank you, JR, for being on the show today. I think that's all we got to cover. I think that's all the news. Uh, We're going to record a little early next week on Thursday. uh, Me and Tiffany will record our uh, record our uh, double or nothing preview. We will also announce the winner of the contest. So uh, it will you can keep entering up until Thursday at noon. So what that means for everyone, when this will be the 61st episode. I'm going to upload the 61st episode. All you have to do is like, retweet, comment with the thing you're most looking forward to at Double or Nothing. Doesn't matter what it is. Uh, thing you're most looking forward to at Double or Nothing, you're entered in a contest. I will draw a name. And you will get uh, Fight TV, BR Live, however you want to watch the show. I will flip the bill. You know, the show will flip the bill. And uh, also, you have a few more hours. I don't know how long the show is going to take to get out. I think it will be out in the next hour or two. Uh, you have a few more hours to enter Tiffany's contest to win a T-shirt and a shot glass uh, from her that she's given out at All Elite Tiffany's page. But most, like I said, make sure you're paying attention to our page. Like, retweet, comment with what you're most looking forward to. And you will be entered to win uh, a free viewing of Double or Nothing. I am very excited about the show. You excited, sir? Oh, 100%. I'm, I'm excited. Um, and I'd like to thank you again for bringing me on to the, this episode. I always love talking to you about wrestling. Yes, and I, I thank you for being on and being available. Uh, we will. I will be live tweeting. Uh, you know, I'm off that day, and I'm off the next day. I will be live tweeting the whole double to nothing. So uh, make sure you're following the page. And um, thank you, thank you again, Jr. for being on the show. And I'd like to remind you. You know, you looking outside in the world, and the world's starting to open it back up. I want you to take whatever precautions you deem necessary to keep going and uh, to keep going, even if it means staying in. But I'll make sure you're washing your hands, doing the mask, doing all those things that are important, uh, all those things that are important. But whether you are at home going back to work or deciding to venture out to a restaurant, always do your best to be a leader. <music> Thank you.